So we have a function describing the running time, some t of n, let's say, and we need to try to understand how it scales as n gets large. We probably don't care that much about all the details. For example, if we have two algorithms and one of them is taking about 3n squared operations to process an input of size n, and the other is like 2 times n, it's pretty clear which one you're going to try for large values of n. It'll be the one with the 2n. If it's 2n squared versus 3n, again, it's not going to make that much difference. For a large enough n, you're still going to want the linear one as opposed to the quadratic one. The exact point where one becomes preferable to the other might change a little bit, it will, but it's pretty clear that if you're just doing one algorithm for reasonable size input, you definitely want to do the linear one and not the quadratic one. So we want to make crude distinctions. We want to distinguish between n and n squared, or n log n and n squared, or n squared and n cubed, or n cubed and 2 to the n. Those kind of distinctions. We also don't really care about lower order terms. If we're comparing those two algorithms for large n, the bottom one's going to look roughly like 2n, and the top one's still going to look roughly like 3n squared. Right? For sufficiently large n, those terms are going to dominate. That's your intuition that we have. So we're not really worried too much about constant factors, and we're not really worried too much about lower order terms, and we're certainly not really interested in small values of n. So what we really want to know is something about the growth rate of functions as n goes to infinity, where we make quite crude distinctions. In other words, we consider functions to be basically equivalent if they're the same up to small uh, fluctuations with low order terms or different constants, things like that. But we don't want something like n and n squared to be equivalent. They want to be clearly different. Now luckily there's a standard mathematical notation which we can use for this to make it precise. It's a little complicated to learn at first, but it really is the only way to make sense of the vague intuition we've been talking about. Suppose I have a function f and another function g. These are both functions, let's say, that are defined on the natural numbers and they take non-negative values. We say f is big O of g if so there's a few quantifiers here. There exists some positive constant c, some real number, and some natural number n0, which we're going to call the threshold, such that for all n past this threshold, f of n is at most c times g of n. That's the formal definition, and we have to spend some time understanding that. But this really does capture everything that we want in terms of the intuition of growth rates that we already have. So what we say here intuitively is that f grows no faster than g. That's the way to remember it. And this is the precise definition. To give a little bit more insight, imagine that g of n is never equal to zero, then since everything is positive, I can divide through, and I have this. But what it's saying is that the ratio of f to g is no more than some fixed amount. f never outruns g by more than a fixed amount. 
the reason why I didn't write it like this is that sometimes you have examples where g of n is equal to 0 for some n, and you have to write it like that. But that's the only real reason. Basically, we're saying the ratio is bounded. That's what it means to say that f doesn't grow faster than g. This constant might be, say, 10, so f might be bigger than g for all values of n, but it's not outpacing it to infinity in some sense. Now this n0 is some threshold, could be any non-negative number. The idea behind it is that, suppose we're trying to compare the running time of algorithms. We want to know which ones are better for large inputs. We're not interested in small. So it could be that f represents the running time of one algorithm, g of another algorithm, and it might be that f is worse than g by a long way, it's much, much bigger than g, for small values of n. You may not be able to write this for the first 10 values of n, for example. It may not exist such a constant. But eventually, for n bigger than 10, let's say, you will be able to do that. Okay. So we're just formalizing the idea here that we don't care about some fixed finite number of values. We're looking at what happens as we grow out to infinity. So now we have our definition of what we call big O. There are a couple of related definitions or notations which are derived from this one. Once we understand this, we'll be able to understand these very easily. These are useful for our work later on. The first one is I'm going to say f is omega of g. It just means that g is O of f. Why would we want this notation? It's analogous to the reason why instead of doing everything with less than or equal to, we sometimes find it useful to have greater than or equal to. That's the reason we're going to use that. You'll see that later on. Very closely related definition, we say that f is theta of g if f is o of g and g is o of f, or alternatively, f is omega of g. This will become clear as you use it. The intuition over here was that f grew at most as fast as g. The intuition here is that f grows at least as fast as g, or g grows at most as fast as f. And the intuition here, on the last one, is that f and g grow at the same rate. f grows at most as fast as g, g grows at most as fast as f. So to get some better understanding of this notation, we're now going to look at some examples. So let's start with an example simple one, let's say f of n is 7n plus 5 and g of n is equal to n. We want c and n0 such that 7n plus 5 is less than or equal to c times n for sufficiently large n, all n bigger than or equal to this threshold. We need to come up with them. Now it's pretty obvious looking at it that if you take c equals anything less than 7, it's not going to work. Suppose c was 5 there. If you look at this inequality and you subtract 5n from each side, you're going to get 2n plus 5 is less than or equal to 0 for all large n. They can't hold. So c should be at least 7. Clearly should be bigger than 7, in fact. Even 7 wouldn't work. But anything bigger than 7 will actually work. For example, let's take c equals 8. And we just, we just want that 7n plus 5 is less than or equal to 8n, eventually. And if we solve this, we get n less than or equal to 5, so we can take n0 equals 5. Okay. 
it is the case that 7n plus 5 is less than or equal to 8n as long as n is greater than or equal to 5 because this inequality is actually equivalent to this one. On the other hand, I could use a different value of c. If I have a larger value of c, then I can reduce my n0. So let's say we put c equals 12. Then I just want 7n plus 5 is less than or equal to 12n. That's equivalent to n being greater than or equal to 1. So I can take n0 equals 1 there. Notice that I can never take n0 equals 0. It's never the case that if I put n equals 0, it's going to work. Here I will get 5, and here I'll get 0. So you always have to consider the possibility that you need to have n0 reasonably large, but you can reduce it by increasing the value of c. Now there's nothing special about the 7 and the 5 there. It's pretty clear from this argument that any linear function is going to be big O of n by a similar argument. Let's have a look at some nonlinear example. Well, f of n in this case will be n, which is linear, but g will be, let's say, n squared over 2. And what we want, we want our c and n0 such that n is less than or equal to n squared over 2 for all n times constant c for all n greater than or equal to n0. You can choose different values. It's pretty easy to choose something like c equals 2 because then you're just going to get n less than or equal to n squared. That's what you're trying to show. And that's always true. So in that case, you could actually have n0 equals 0. Or you could take c equals 1. Then you're looking at the inequality. You want this to be true for sufficiently large n. And if you solve this, You get that, and that shows that we want n to be greater than or equal to 2, so n is non-negative. So then you could have n0 equals 2. Doesn't matter, we only need one value of c and n0 to show that it's going to work. And again, it's not important that it's a 2 here. Pretty easy to guess that some linear function is going to be bigger of some quadratic function. Now we would also expect, because intuitively g is growing much faster than f, we would expect that g is not big O of f. Okay, now how do we prove that? We've shown so far how to show that something is big O of something else by solving some inequality. So let's show now that g is not big O of f. And we do that by contradiction. So suppose that g was big O of f. In other words, g is less than or equal to c times f for all n greater than or equal to n0. We'll derive a contradiction from this. Because multiplying through and then bringing it all to one side, we get that this quantity is negative for all sufficiently large n. But c is a constant. That's not possible because n gets is large and positive. This is large and positive, the product will be large and positive. That's a contradiction. 
Our original assumption was wrong. This is not correct. G is not big O of F. So we've just shown that for these functions F and G, that F is O of G, and G is not O of F. And that agrees with our intuition, right? Intuitively, this means that F grows no faster than G. That's pretty obvious. And similarly, it's not the case that G grows no faster than F. In other words, it's not the case that F grows at least as fast as G. Another way of saying that is that those two statements are equivalent by the definition we had before. But of course, we didn't know that formally. We intuitively believed that, but this definition is designed to formalize the intuition. So when we deal with functions that are a little bit more complicated, we can actually get the correct answer by formal calculation if we need to. So we'll do one more example, which does not involve polynomials, at least not both of them. f of n is going to be n log n, doesn't matter, we'll use the binary log. And g of n, let's say, is n squared. And we want to show that f is O of g. So in other words, we want c n0 such that n log n is less than or equal to c times n squared whenever n is sufficiently big, greater than or equal to n0. Well, it shouldn't be too hard. Let's try n c equals 1. What we're trying to show then is that n log n is less than or equal to n squared n is n can be assumed to be positive n equals 0 doesn't even make sense here because of log n not being defined so n should be at least 1 we can divide through by it and we're trying to show that log n is less than or equal to n but that's always true the logarithm of something is always smaller than the number itself because 2 to this thing is equal to that So that's always true. In other words, I can take n0 equal 1. And that accords with our intuition. We think that n log n should grow slower than n squared. Try graphing it, having a look at it if you don't believe that. But the point is that log n grows much slower than n, so if you multiply each of them by n, you would expect the growth rate still to be quite different. So now it's time for the questions. First one, quite simple, based on the examples we saw before, just to make sure that you've been paying attention. What is the relationship between n0 and c? In the definition, not the exact quantitative relationship, but how do they vary? How does one vary with respect to the other one? I'll go to the third question, get that one out of the way. In a lot of textbooks, you'll see people writing f equals o of g. That's a bad idea for several reasons. One is that you would expect equals to be a symmetric operation, but it, you, no one ever writes O of G equals F. Actually, O of G is really a set of functions, and so if you were ever going to write anything like that, you would probably write it like this. F is the member of the O of G, which is the class of functions which have a certain property, that they grow no faster than G. But I don't want to do that either. It's a little bit too heavy in notation for a course like this. So I've just been using is. So basically, I've answered the question, how is that notation related to this? Is that it's the same, saying the same thing? but it's saying it in a way that could be more confusing. What I want you to do, though, is look it up. Look up big O notation online, and just look at four or five sources, and you'll see how many of them use the equals sign. So just make sure you're not confused by that. Now, a question you probably have been thinking about, do we have to do this amount of work all the time? Are we going to spend the rest of the course 
writing down inequalities and solving them? And the answer is no. It's the same feeling you would have when you're starting a course in calculus and you're having to work out the derivative of x squared from the definition or the derivative of sine x and you're thinking, do I have to do all of these things? But luckily you end up with these nice rules like the sum rule, the product rule and the chain rule which enable you to derive the answers for more complicated functions from ones that you've already done. Similar thing is true here. Okay, we will be able to do that as it turns out. Try and think about some basic rules and see whether you can prove any of them from the definition. Finally, we dealt with very simple functions here so far. n, n squared, n log n, quite simple functional forms. It turns out that we have many more complicated things that can turn up in analysis of algorithms. For example, the sum of the first n reciprocals. Okay, it's called the harmonic number. Comes up a lot. We might want to look at this number. Sum of logs. In fact, we will. So how do we estimate the size of that for large n? That's a much more complicated looking expression. We need to develop a little bit of technique for that. It's a good puzzle. Think about this. Notice that this is quite small as n gets big. This is quite large. You have a large number of terms of very different sizes being added together. It's not obvious what the average size of the term is. For now, Work hard on unpacking that definition. Okay, there exists n0, there exists c such that for all n, there's three quantifiers in there, it takes a bit of thinking. Important that you put some work in to understand that. And we'll see you at the next lecture.